Hello, this is the uh, Methodologies for Social Science Applied Sociology Narrated Lecture number 9. And this week we are going to get on to talking about um, the sociology of advertising and the kind of theories that the, the group who are doing the interviews for advertising will, I say, will need to apply. There are other theories you might prefer to imply, apply instead, but these theories will be useful to you. And hopefully even those two groups who are not doing the um, advertising theme for your interviews will nonetheless find some of these ideas interesting and possibly relevant for things like your dissertation or other um, bits of coursework you're doing on various modules. <coughs> we'll also go on to look at discourse analysis and um, some of the basic ideas around emic and etic approaches to research. So if we start with um, the issue of the sociology of advertising and some of the theories around there, and as a um, starter for 10, one of the people in the, that photograph there I used to teach ethics to. <laughs> There's a thought, which one? Some of you will already know, and some of you can pop a guess. Uh, so we'll flash back from Love Island 2019 or 2020, whichever season that was, I can't remember now, um, to Theodore Adorno back in 1963, who was one of the early vo voices in sociology talking about the potency and power of advertising um, and also critiquing it and seeing it as a somewhat negative force. For Adorno, his concern was that advertising had commodified um, the arts, music, um, theatre, all sorts of other areas of artistic creative endeavour and turned it into just another thing to purchase. It might well be argued that Adorno was perhaps a little bit um, late to this argument in that there were people suggesting um, that culture had been commodified for a fair stretch of time earlier than 1960s. But nonetheless, whether, whether it did indeed kick in in the 60s or it had been happening perhaps as early as the late Victorian period, well, that one is, is a question for historians to debate over quite when culture became commodified. But the key issue here is not so much when, but the nature of that commodification. So Adorno's point is that advertising doesn't simply hoik chocolate bars and cars and shoes. Advertising becomes a force to sell practically anything. And uh, obviously the, the chief focus of Adorno's concern there was the selling of um, art and music and so forth. It being reduced to that of a commercial product rather than something of innate intrinsic cultural worth artistic merit and significance and so forth but also what he was seeing in terms of tv shows and obviously love island did not exist in any shape for more guys back in the 1960s so heaven alone knows what Adorno would have made of love island was that um, popular culture had a tendency to focus on what could be marketed to the masses? What did the majority of people want? And therefore what they wanted was what sold, was what became marketed, was what was created. So people who created culture, artists, composers, scriptwriters, TV directors, film producers, and so forth, would not necessarily be making things that were of great artistic merit, or of a, a idealistic visionary nature so that the notion of the artist painting their vision would become less and less as time went on and more and more what you'd get instead would be artists painting whatever they thought their customers would be persuaded to purchase which could include things that the artists themselves had nothing but contempt for but they knew the, the buying public would go for and so the, the long-term end of that is, well, the Love Island type phenomena of what's usually referred to these days as trash TV, things that are not particularly 
uplifting or inspiring or uh, educational or any great significant cultural merit, but are hugely popular and get uh, loads and loads and loads of viewers and so make a ton of money for the people creating them. Is Adorno right? Does applying popularity to the area of culture reduce the quality of culture, turn it into simply a product to be bought and sold, no different from a can of baked beans? Or is this a bit of upper middle class snobbery looking down on the, the, the vulgar tastes of the hoi polloi? So whilst things that were perhaps considered to be vulgar by Adorno back in the 60s might, in comparison to some of the track we have on TV these days, seem positively highbrow. Is there still, is there an element of snobbery here? So is, is Love Island or um, other hugely popular things, like Midsummer Murders for argument's sake, are these things of lesser worth, lesser value, lesser significance than some terribly highbrow thing that only 10,000 people watch or enjoy or participate in compared to something that maybe millions and millions of people watch or enjoy or participate in that, uh, that is um, not necessarily as, um, what should we say, taxing, intellectually taxing as um, the, the highbrow stuff that comparatively few people want or enjoy or participate in. So how do we understand these um, factors, these elements? Part of Adorno's argument is underpinned by the notion that if your sole goal is to sell a product, the worth and value of that product is of less and less relevance because advertising papers over the cracks within the product. It makes something that's not particularly good seem better than it is. It's about selling selling something, uh, beefing it up, making it sound really good, even though it probably isn't in reality. Um, playing on the potential gullibility of the purchasing audience. That and This applies whether you're selling a TV show or whether you're selling a car or whether you're selling a, a foreign holiday or whatever the thing might be. That the job of the advertiser is to glamorize the product that they are selling rather than be realistic about it. And so what is being purchased is less and less the object itself and more and more the glamour, the hype, the hyperbole that has been whipped up by the advertising executives around the product. And TV shows as much as, as new cars have advertising executives whipping up hype around them. They were doing it back in the 60s, they're doing it still today, and if we're all still around in 100 years time, I said, well, I won't be around in 100 years time, but if um, society is still around in 100 years time, there will no doubt be advertisers whipping up hype about whatever on earth it is that they're trying to sell to people 100 years from now. So part of how this is all well and good as a theory, but how do you apply this to your interviews? Part of it is start, starting to think about, um, because the, the tone of those interviews is focusing on someone who has purchased at least one thing, if not lots of things, that they have later regretted buying, they've, they've been suckered into the advert. So in other words, they've been taken into the hype. So part of what you're starting to think about is what was the nature of the hype that took this interviewee in, that persuaded them to purchase something that they later Perhaps when they got the product and they saw it wasn't really anything like the hype it suggested it would be. Did they feel disappointed? Did they feel aggrieved in some way? So how does that hype work? How does the sales pitch work? Part and parcel of this, um, we're moving on to Herbert Marcuse, is, again, soon 66, is to think that part of sales pitch, part of the hype, and again, it doesn't matter what the object being sold is, part of it these days increasingly, and if it was true in the 1960s, it's still, according to um, Zizek, very, very true today, all these decades on, 
is the sale of identity. That what you're being persuaded to buy is an object, uh, an experience, if it's something like a TV show or a film or a holiday, is something that will help define the kind of person you are. It will help define your identity. It will help you express yourself. Uh, Marcuse was particularly interested in this um, notion that advertising helped generate false need. So people have, gen he said people have genuine needs and they have false needs. A genuine need is for food. Toilet rolls, apparently. Um, the basic necessities of life, so things you would struggle to get by without. And we can question what those are. So you've now got people arguing, terribly currently, that internet access is a necessity rather than a luxury. And obviously you wouldn't be able to listen to this um, narrated lecture without internet access, just as I wouldn't be able to create it without internet access. So has that shifted from being a luxury a decade or two ago to becoming a necessity for education, for work, for um, you know, applying for benefits, for booking into your doctor, for all sorts of things in this day and age. So what is a necessity and what is a luxury shift and change over time? But people have the genuine needs, the things that they would struggle to do without. And then we have the luxury needs, the stuff that we could easily do without, that our life would not be any the worse off if we didn't have but which Marcus says we are convinced we must have to be, well, to be what? Therein is the question. To be part of some social movement, to be part of the trendy set, to be part of the in crowd, um, to be part of whatever identity group we believe we ought to be part of, or we feel that we already are part of and we want to stay within it. We don't want to be left behind as the, the fads and the trends move on to something else. Um, so the quote there, people recognize themselves in their commodities. They find their soul in their automobile, hi-fi sets, split level homes. Social control is anchored in the new needs which the consumer society has produced. And so this is Marcuse's critique of consumerism. Split level homes were a thing in the 60s and they're not so much these days. Um, this urge to recognize themselves in their commodities. So it's things like designer label labels on clothing. If you or somebody you know is very, very conscious of designer labels, you, you wouldn't leave the house unless you were wearing some, some label that helps identify your tastes, your um, cultural expressions. And this isn't necessarily always about sort of snobbery and wanting the latest high brain thing. So a, a, a goth or a punk is someone expressing their identity through their choice of clothing, their choice of music, their choice of hair dye, their choice of cosmetics, uh, a whole raft of different things. And it's not necessarily the latest flashy design label type stuff. It may be obscure ranges that anybody outside of that um, subcultural movement would possibly never even have heard of, let alone see as high end or anything like that. Um, yeah, if you are a, a science fiction geek, then maybe having the latest Star Trek or Doctor Who or whatever it is um, DVD release might be the in thing to have, even if anyone who is not a science fiction geek would attach no worth or significance to that whatsoever. So it's not always a, about being upper class with the latest, most exotic, most expensive designer label clothing. It can be other forms of must have identity as well, depending on which niche market you're looking at. Um, so we create ourselves through our possessions, essentially is what Marcus is arguing. We signify to others, and this is where we're getting into the realms of um, creating meaning and symbolic interactionism and so on. So what is the point of a label on a, on a, a jumper or whatever the article of clothing happens to be? Well, the label is there, that designer label, to be read. It's to be read by other people. So if I'm wearing that lacrosse um, jumper, 
I'm not very with it, so I'm assuming lacrosse do make jumpers. <laughs> well, I might have made a huge social faux pas there, but never mind. Let's, let's assume for the moment that they do. So I'm wearing that lacrosse jumper with the designer logo on it. Um, it only serves to define me if other people that I bump into read it, spot it, and I know it's a design. When I say read, I'm not talking about letters on a page necessarily. A logo, an image, is still a form of reading when it comes to symbolic interactions. Um, so other people need to read it and, more importantly, recognise it. If they look at it and they don't understand what it is, then the the symbolic conveyance, the, there is no interaction there between me, them and the symbol, because they're not understanding the significance of it. So someone who is, as let's say, as clueless as I am when it comes to fashion, you may have noticed that, um, if I bump into someone who's wearing some fancy designer range, there is a 95% chance I will completely fail to identify it and recognize it and therefore appreciate what they are saying about themselves. So those sorts of labels are not intended for the benefit of clueless muppets like me. They're intended for the benefit of the in crowd who will recognize that label and ooh and ah and say, oh, I see you've got the latest Givenchy or whatever the thing is. And kickstarts a conversation in which that the person wearing it defines themselves by wearing it. And this, when I, we talk about wearing here, it could be carrying a handbag. It could be the fact that someone has got some... Uh, carrying a, a, a case with the latest designer computer in it that they want other computer fanatics to notice and identify. It could be a perfume and aftershave that they want someone to sniff and not simply say, ooh, that's nice, but to say, ooh, I see you're wearing so-and-so. Paco Rabanne or whatever it may be. It's to be recognized. It's to be identified. Um, we are making a statement that I am this sort of person. Now, if you've ever taken part in amateur dramatics, Part of amateur dramatics is creating the costume, creating the look for a particular type of character. So you want to convey the personality of the, the character you're playing in the stage play. Um, part of the way of doing that is not simply delivering the lines and maybe putting on an accent or something in that way, but it's also your choice of costume. You want the audience to easily recognise that you are the, the dotty old spinster, or you are the tough, hard-nosed detective or you are the um, glamorous sex siren in the play or whatever the thing is. And so clothing is costume, it's theatre costume. It all goes to convey symbols to the person, uh, the, the audience in the case of a stage play or the people we bump into in the case of daily life, to convey meaning and significance to them. And even if you're not wearing anything that's designed a label, even if you like me, you get half your clothes from charity shops. Uh, you might be choosing colour schemes. You might be choosing, do you go for sleek and elegant, or do you go for loud and colourful, or do you go for um, chunky and cosy? What's, what's your fashion taste? So even if there are no labels involved, where no one is likely to ooh and ah over the fashion house that you have acquired your clobber from, you might, so you might, you will undoubtedly, at least if you're a symbolic interactionist, you believe everybody is in the act of conveying image. Whether that image is that you just fell out of bed five minutes ago and you're a bit of a bad boy, bad girl type thing with that crumpled look, or whether the message conveyed is that you're sleek and you're elegant and you're professional and sophisticated, or whether the image is that you are an intellectual with um, elbow pads and a pipe and granny glasses or, or whatever the kind of image you're trying to convey is. It's all about sending a message. I am this type of a person. Now, whether you really live up to your image, that's an entirely separate story. And obviously, in the case of actors, they're constantly shifting between different images all of the time to convey different personalities in whatever film, TV, show, stage play they're in. But in a sense, we are all actors. In a sense, when we go to an inter a business interview, let's say a job interview rather than not a business interview, um, you are trying to convey a message to the people interviewing you. If you're just traipsing around the supermarket, picking up your groceries, 
you are conveying a different image to whoever you bump into in the supermarket. If you are going out for an evening at a big London theatre, obviously not at this moment in time, but back in when we were allowed to go out to big London theatres, you might want to convey a very different sort of message to the the other theatre goers that you might be rubbing shoulders with. And even if the only message you want to convey is that you do actually own a shower and use it sometimes, that in itself is still a message compared to someone conveying a message that they don't own a shower or use it, which is a somewhat different kind of a message to convey. Um, Mark Hughes's bit there about um, things becoming masked by their exchange value. An exchange value isn't just the, the price tag in the shop, it's also the cultural significance attached to having a particular type of car, a particular type of um, music centre, a particular set of clothing. That exchange value that you have acquired from whoever sold you the goods in the first place includes the price tag but also the cultural significance attached to it and that cultural significance may be of more importance Marcuse argues very very frequently is of much more importance than innate use in other words does it actually do the job it says it does so some old um, mini metro and a limousine will both drive you from A to B both get you from one place to another they both do the same job they both have the same functionality the same innate use but one is vastly more expensive than the other arguably one might be a lot more comfortable or a lot speedier or a lot better in terms of petrol consumption and expense and all those sorts of lavas than the other so there will be kind of um, specific additional details involved in that innate use but the actual function of a car to drive you from one place to another place both will do equally well but the exchange value of a limousine is significantly different to the exchange value of a mini its cultural value its um its iconography the way it portrays itself or the way more well not so much portrays itself but what it portrays about you the owner of the object and so part of this is about buying identity again linking this back into your um coursework those of you doing this one or contemplating some related issue with dissertation what have you has the the interviewee purchased something because they felt it would convey a sense of identity were they trying to convey something about themselves by purchasing the article and if they were therefore disappointed when it when they got home and opened the packet and looked at it did it fail to convey the identity they wanted to convey or was it that sometime between making the purchase and becoming disappointed Perhaps they had changed their sense of identity in some subtle way. And so the article in question maybe had conveyed their identity at the time they handed over the cash. But a short time thereafter, their identity had moved on and that article no longer served that symbolic function that the person wanted it to serve, perhaps. So Sam, back in 1916, was very interested in um, semiotics. We have touched a bit on this in previous weeks, such as when we were looking at the front cover of National Geographic and that um, graffiti art by Banksy, which is about semiotics. Semiotics is the study of symbolism, how colours, shape, form, imagery, number, etc. can all convey symbolic messages to the observer. Uh, Saucer's argument is that advertising, which in Saucer's day was chiefly advertising via the radio, but also primarily via newspapers, billboards, magazines, um, printed forms of advertising, 
makes use of um, symbols, makes use of icons, makes use of imagery. And those images convey concepts, convey ideas, convey notions, which um, make something that might appear to be a very basic, very simplistic advert in a magazine into a conveyor of far deeper, far more convoluted notions, concepts, ideas, which, if you want to get a bit Freudian, largely get absorbed by the observer at an unconscious level and then shape and form their conscious decisions. So when we buy, we go out to buy OXO cubes, is it because we like gravy or is it because we've seen 101 OXO adverts over the years telling us that OXO cubes are associated with happy family gatherings of mums and dads and children and everyone sitting around the table happy and smiling and laughing um, being all cosy and domestic and homely and lovely and smashing. And so rather than the OXO cube being sold as this makes gravy, it tastes quite nice. Instead it sold as this will bring your family together. This will give you those warm, lovely domestic moments where you all sit around a table and you all laugh at each other and everyone's smashing and happy rather than slamming doors and being moody teenagers or uh, strange spouses or, or any of the usual kind of domestic discords that go on for a lot of people in real life. So what you're buying into is not gravy, it's domestic bliss. You buy the Yoxo cube, you go home, you make your gravy. Will a, um, a bit of gravy on your dinner plate bring domestic bliss? Clearly not. It may or may not taste nice, depending on, on your you know, culinary preferences. But it won't bring you domestic bliss. If, you, if your home life is happy, that will be nothing to do with the gravy. That's down to other factors entirely. But what are we buying here? Well, Suser says we buy into the imagery. We buy into the subtle nuances of the posters or in this day and age TV adverts or internet adverts or whatever the thing may be. We buy into all of that more than we buy into the actual product itself. And so to understand what it is that's being sold to you, you have to look at the semiotics. Um, we're not really touching on Saucer in any depth there, just flagging him up that you might want to look at him for future reference. Because his ideas are quite involved in terms in terms of how we analyze imagery and so forth. Um, Shlevoy Zizek, in his quote there, what we are effectively buying when we are buying organic food, etc., is already a certain cultural experience, the experience of a healthy ecological lifestyle. So Zizek, ever the cynic, suggests that um, not only can we buy into things like the happy domestic bliss of the Oxo cube, but we can buy into a whole raft of things. So you go and buy organic apples from a greengrocer. Is it just an apple that you're buying? Or are you buying into a lifestyle? Now, you could, on your very next purchase, buy something terribly inorganic. So because you bought one bag of organic apples doesn't mean that everything you eat, drink, consume is also very, very organic. That could just be a one-off purchase, a one-off product. But for Zizek, in the, the moment of purchase, you're getting a sort of um, an illusion of buying into a lifestyle, of buying into a way of being that's healthier, because we have this notion that organic means healthy, that organic means ecological. And we can argue the toss over that one, at least we could if we had plenty of time, we don't, but you can mull over how healthy, how ecological organic food actually is in the long run, but it gives this sense that what you're consuming is healthy. Not only healthy for you, but healthy for the planet. It's the, the whole green issue. Do you feel you're being green by buying those apples? In and of itself, one bag of apples is not going to make you green or healthy or anything else. But for Zizek, part of this is that semiotic purchasing experience, but part of it also with his, his jaded hat on, his cynical hat on, is that 
political ideology is a consumer good. So just as art and music and culture are consumer goods, things to be bought and sold and, and acquired and displayed. Um, and when I say displayed, well, that, let's go back to the, do you display Love Island per se? Not necessarily, unless anyone is sitting on the sofa with you watching it. But imagine you've got a DVD collection, all the last series of Love Island sitting on your shelf and somebody comes around to your house as a visitor. They might glance at the DVDs on your shelf and then you are displaying your taste for Love Island. Just as if they glance at the books on your shelf, you're displaying your taste in literature. Now there's nothing to say you've actually read any of those books. Just as there's nothing to say you've actually watched any of those DVDs, of course. And, and certainly going back to Victorian and Edwardian times, there were people, very well-off people, who would often buy books by the yard. That is to say, someone, a bookseller, would sell them enough books to fill a shelf. Not because the person, the customer, had the slightest intention of reading any of those books. They were to be displayed in the library so that when guests and visitors came round, they would see a well-stocked library and that would suggest, imply, that the owner of the house was intellectual. Even if they'd never once picked up a single book in their library and read it, even if they had no idea what the titles were because they just purchased two shelves worth of books without any real interest in what the books were about. They just wanted something to fill a shelf so that other people would think they were intellectual. So culture here becomes a form of advertising when that culture is expressed in material form, the book, the DVD. But also, let's say you go to the theatre, or the ballet, or the opera, or the, the whatever it is, by going to, to the opera, you are seen at the opera. Now, it may be that absolutely nobody there recognises you, in which case it's not much advertising. But on the other hand, it may be that you bump into friends, you bump into people you work with, you might bump into um, customers if you work in, in that kind of line of work and you have customers. You might bump into all sorts of people who do recognise you and then you are seen to be consuming opera or theatre or a stage play or a rock concert or whatever the thing may be. And therefore that becomes part of your identity. Now you could, once the lights go down and you're in your seat, fall asleep. You could be bored to death by the whole experience, but it's important for you to be seen at the right kind of venues. The plays of Oscar Wilde are filled with these sorts of um, references to snobby people who go along to things like that, the theatre and the opera in order to be seen, not because they're remotely interested in that particular stage play or that particular um, opera production. They just want to be seen at the right locations. And it's all about the showing off, the consumption, the consumerism. It's all about that and not about the quality of the art. So Adorno's point that the artistic merit is lost in favour of the consumer element doesn't just go in terms of crass, tacky, popular culture being a better seller than highbrow culture. Because going back decades before Adorno was writing there, it's also that kind of snobbishness. Look at me, I'm at the opera. Look at me, I'm at the, the latest theatre play by Ibsen. The fact that you're bored to tears by the whole experience is neither here nor there. You want to be seen. It's that kind of consumerism. So there's different ways to consume culture. Um, just as there's different ways to be seen to consume politics. So you might wear a, a badge displaying your support for some politician or some you know, the Labour Party, the Tory Party, the Lib Dems, whoever it is, that you've got a badge showing your support for them. Or you have a t-shirt with a logo on it. Or you go to Extinction Rebellion and you buy a tote bag with that runic design on that signifies you support Extinction Rebellion. Or CND, back in the day, you could have a, a, a bag displaying your loyalty to CND. And the cause, now, just because you've got the badge or the t-shirt or the, the bag doesn't mean a damn thing. You might not do a single thing to support. So you could have your Extinction Rebellion tote bag and still fly around the world running up huge um, 
amounts of pollution. You could have the most gas-guzzling car. You could sling your plastics into the nearest river. You could do the most dismal, awful things and still own that bag with that um, Extinction Rebellion symbol on it. So, in other words, just because you've consumed the product doesn't actually mean a damn thing. Just as somebody can go to the theatre and fall asleep throughout the whole play, but they want to be seen at the theatre, not because they enjoy it, but because they want to make a statement. So, in this same way, Zizek is saying that political identity becomes a form of consumerism. You purchase it, you purchase the goods of it, and people may or may not assume you do this, do that, believe this, vote that, etc. In actuality, you might not do any of those things. You've just got an image which goes no deeper than skin depth. He does talk about it in much more um, angles and depths than this. Part of his argument is that capitalism essentially um, buys out rebellion. So the instant that you start buying the t-shirts and buying the um, protest placards and buying the masks, instantly capitalism is won. So even if the protest is against capitalism, such as the Extinction Rebellion ones are, then instantly capitalism cashes in on it. And it's like a game of chess between two forces. As soon as it commodifies the cause, turns it into things you can buy and sell and you know, maybe those t-shirts some of them are made in um, factories by six-year-olds in sweatshops and so one minute you're all kind of noble and protesting a cause and the next minute you're buying something made by an exploited six-year-old that that is capitalism in action is Zizek so I mean, he's very anti-capitalist himself but he is very alert shall we say to the fact that the system even when somebody thinks they're rebelling and standing against it, they can be subtly co-opted without them even realising it's going on so that they become part of the very system they think they're rebelling against and are actively supporting that system by purchasing the identity-based products when they think that they are rebelling against it. He's a little bit bleak at times. So you could think about the, again, back to the coursework, the advertising, what symbols in the adverts worked? What got the person to purchase the goods? How did that advert persuade them? Was part of it uh, some object, some item that they were buying into? They were buying into a particular culture, a particular social class, a particular political ideology, or whatever it might be, that they were trying to kind of acquire some sense of themselves by purchasing this this article that was part and parcel of all of that. Um, Roland Barthes, uh, quite a lot of um, European philosophers involved in these um, mullings over of advertising, and again, we're back to the 60s. Uh, this, this was a, a key decade for people to start critiquing and debating the um, the nature of what they were being bombarded with through TV and radio and newspapers. So, Baths develops a very involved understanding of semiotics. Um, if this is something that interests you, especially if, if we're thinking dissertation stuff here, then his books are definitely worth getting. Um, they were originally written in French, but you can get the English translations now if you, you aren't a fluent French reader. Um, and these ideas are a lot more involved than the four little bits I'm going to touch on here. But this is just a, a sort of a surface level gloss over, if you like, to encourage you to read deeper. So he follows this same notion, and this is that denoted and connoted is essentially building on Saussure and just slightly changing the language a little bit. So the denoted message is what it says on the tin, in effect. So you buy a product or you look at an advert and the advert could be an advert in a newspaper, it could be an advert on TV or the actual object itself might well be covered in writing if it's a tin, you know, the cooking instructions and the ingredients and the various things that's actually written on the box or the tin or, or the object in and of itself are all forms of advertising. They are the donated messages, what it actually says. 
However, that is not the critical factor. That's the surface level. What's much more interesting are the connoted messages, the cultural, social, personal associations that you as the consumer draw are, and are encouraged to draw by the um, company that has designed that advert or designed the label on the tin or box or whatever it is. The subtle messages, the, the hidden messages, the things that you will walk away from thinking and believing and, and deriving from what you have um, seen. Because in effect, that's what you're buying into. That's what sells you the product, not the den denoted message, but the connoted message. The, the one, the connotation is that you draw, the implications that you draw from it, most of which you're possibly drawing at a, a rather unconscious level without being fully aware of the nature of the messages that are impacting on your decision-making process. Um, so you might um, see a car advert in a newspaper which is very sleek and glossy and has some very glamorous models driving it or draped across the bonnet of it. Male and female models alike will tend to be very, very glamorous, very very well dressed, very expensively groomed. And the implication here is that the denoted message may say, oh, this car goes from 0 to 60 in, in so many seconds. And you get this amount to the gallon and, and you know, goes into the, the the denoted message in the advert may be the technical details of the car. The connoted messages are that if you buy this car, you'll be as sexy and glamorous as the the models involved in advertising it or you will be able to date people who are as sexy and glamorous as the models, depending on your you know, the gender relationships and sexual preferences and all the rest of it, that you will attain to that somewhat James Bond look of driving a flash glamorous sports car. You will be sophisticated and dynamic. I mean, in reality, you might be some fat little man with a comb over and a hell of a large bank account. But with the car, you might feel as if you look like James Bond. And you might subconsciously believe that you will get the very leggy, glamorous model in a skimpy bikini who's draped all over the boot of the car. Um, or bonnet, even. <laughs> Don't fall off the boot, would you? Um, because that is the connoted message, that you'll become part of this elite. You'll become an admired figure. People will look up to you. They'll ooh and ah as your car whizzes past and they'll think what an exciting person it must be behind the wheel of that car. And as per the OXO message with the domestic bliss, does buying the car make you exciting? Well, if you were as dull as Ditchwater before you bought the car, you'll probably still be as dull as Ditchwater after you bought the car. So in and of itself, it will not make a person exciting. It will be a talking point, I dare say, as you park the car and people go, oh, that's, that's a really nice car. But that's about as far as it goes. It's, it's no deeper than that. Now, one thing that Bath draws out is this notion of anchorage. To say that most images, most semiotic conveyances in any given culture are multi-layered. So take, let's take something like an apple. An apple, what does an apple represent? Well, it might make you think of the Garden of Eden and the apple of temptation that from the tree of knowledge of good and evil that the, the serpent tries to tempt Adam and Eve into eating. It might make you think of Apple computers. It might make you think of, um, let's say, Christmas, freshness, healthiness. It might make you think of William Tell balancing the apple on his son's head and firing it off with a crossbow bolt. It could bring up 101 different images depending on what part of the world you're from, the cultural significance and imagery associated with apples in the, the culture that you've been brought up in or now living. Which one of those endless, endless possible readings and significances and images does the advertiser actually want you to think of? Do they want you to think of seduction and temptation? Or do they want you to think of crispness and healthiness and, and freshness? or one of the other meanings. Well, anchorage is the way in which the advertiser tries to get you to focus on this set of symbolic meanings 
instead of that set of symbolic meanings. So they're trying to direct you which of the symbols or which of the interpretations of the symbols rather they want you to start thinking about. And that's where you get into the kind of technical analysis uh, and visual analysis of imagery, which is something that might not much use for the interviews, but it might um, appeal to you as a dissertation topic if you want to include some kind of visual analysis of a, whether it's an advert or, or anything else, where you're trying to pick apart the semiotics, the imagery, to flag up not only the range of meanings that could be interpreted, but how the advertiser tries to anchor the viewer into one particular interpretation, rather than getting drawn into all of the other possible interpretations. If that's something that interests you, let me know and next year, dissertation year, will include some seminars on how to in, a, analyze imagery and draw out anchorage and so on, ready for you to write it up for your reports. Um, the last bit of Bath's uh, theory that I'll, I'll focus on here are his arguments around myth. Now he uses myth in a rather um, sweeping way, which as somebody who teaches religious studies I find somewhat annoying, <laughs> but that's just me. Uh, he's not using myth in its religious context, he's using myth here as mythos, the underlying story behind something. And effectively he's saying that an advert, whether we're talking a TV advert, an internet advert, uh, a static billboard or a newspaper advert, what have you, any kind of advert is successful really if it conveys a story the unsuccessful ones perhaps their failures down to the fact that they don't convey a story or at least they don't do it very well we buy we are not buying a product we are buying a narrative we're buying a story we are buying a tale so going back to the oxo cube stuff what you are buying is the story of happy families and domestic bliss this is just not just for this one meal with this oxo cube gravies put on the dinner you'll be happy but the underlying story that families ought to be happy yes they'll have their ups and downs but the story is that mum dad and the 2.4 kids get together they, they form a unit and deep down they love each other they share meals together they go walking in the woods together they play football together they do all these lovely things together and that is the story of family of what family ought to be. And some families are indeed like that, but there are plenty of families who are nothing remotely like that. So there is a story about what families ought to be. That's the narrative, that's the image. And it's the one held up as a cultural ideal that, that this is the kind of family that all advertisers try to encourage us to participate in the happy, smiling, sharing, loving, supportive type of unit. Um, a product wouldn't get terribly far if the narrative in the advert was buy this item and you know, buy this frying pan, you can fracture your husband's skull with it far more effectively the next time you're having an argument. That would not sell terribly well as, a, as an advertising campaign. Because who wants to buy into a product that enables violence and domestic conflict and, and ranting and screaming and shouting? People want to buy into things that will make them happy, and we're told that being part of a jolly, supportive family where everyone loves each other will make you happy. And realistically, by and large, it probably will do. Um, you know, being loved and supported is usually something that makes the vast majority of people happy. There'll be the odd one or two people in the world who wouldn't be happy with that, but the majority of people are. So it's part and parcel of that whole um, sales pitch. And so Baths wrote extensively analysing adverts back in the 60s, looking at the narratives, the myths, the stories, which one simple, apparently simple, at least, image would convey to the consuming public. Or at least what it conveyed to him, whether it conveyed that to everybody who looked at that advert, I suppose is a slightly different question. But he gave some very involved interpretations of adverts to say, this is actually what it's saying. It's not selling what you think it's selling, it's selling something much more involved, much more complex, much more sophisticated. And it has to be said, there are um, advertisers who've taken Bath's argument so well to heart that they create um, 
adverts, often series of adverts that are almost like mini soap operas. Uh, so for, for those of you listening who are of a certain age, um, and I'm using this, this particular example because I don't really follow adverts these days. I, my brain turns off when they come on, so I'm not conscious of modern day versions of this. I'm sure there must be. But when I were young, there are a series of adverts for coffee in which Anthony Head, who became famous in appearing in um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and various other things, he was the librarian, he's, he's done a ton of other things. But back when he was a jobbing young actor, he was the bachelor um, who lived in the upstairs flat and there was uh, a woman, I can't remember the name of that actress actually, who lived, who was a single woman who lived in the downstairs flat and they were both obviously in high powered jobs, they weren't just kind of scraping by, they were flash. And then one of them would come downstairs and knock on the other's doors and say, oh, can I borrow some coffee? And over a series of ongoing adverts, they got closer and closer and it was a developing romance within the story. And that's fundamentally what it was. This wasn't just saying, buy our coffee, it tastes nice. This was saying, buy our coffee and you'll be part of the glamorous, sophisticated single set and, as the adverts went on, you will find love because coffee brings people together. It gets them talking. It's a, a ploy so that you can chat up that glamorous person who lives downstairs. And so there's people became interested in the story. And they were actually you know, people who, who followed the series of adverts in the same way that other people follow soap operas wanting to know what would happen next. Would they get together? Would they not? Would they marry? Would they not? And it was just 30 second adverts for coffee. But the campaign agency that created that did such an effective job that it drew people into the story, the myth, the nar narrative of this um, two youngish people and would, that, would they or would they not get together. That's what sold the coffee. Not the flavor, not the taste, not the cost, but the story that was being spun around it it works. So there are the social functions of advertising. Um, Judith Williamson's quote there, um, advertising has a function which I believe in many ways replaces that traditionally fulfilled by art and religion. It creates meaning. So you purchase the object because the object gives meaning to your life. In the same way, I was going to say once upon a time, but clearly there are still many, many people around the world for whom religion still does give meaning. So this isn't a thing of the past, but perhaps not quite as many people these days find meaning through religion as used to, let's say, 200 years ago. So once upon a time, the majority of people would have found the meaning for their life through stories in the Bible or the Quran or the Rig Vedas, depending on which bit of the world we're in. Um, Williamson is saying that as relatively smaller numbers, yes, the numbers of people who find their meaning through religion dwindle a bit, at least in the West, what do they turn to instead? Well, some people will turn to art, they'll find the meaning of their life through um, Wagnerian opera or whatever it is that floats their boat, but increasing people will turn to finding meaning through consumerism. They've bought the goods that give meaning and structure and shape to their life, but they won't know about those goods unless they first see the adverts for those goods, and it's really the adverts that convey the meaning. So uh, a bottle of Ralph Lauren scent in and of itself is just a bottle of scent. It does nothing. It just sits there on the shelf. It's the advertising campaign that's spun around it that gives it gives meaning, gives the story, gives the um, semantic function of the, the bottle, if you like, of that bottle of scent. It's what shapes it, creates it, produces that story, that myth, in terms of, of Bath's use of the words, that's what makes it a desirable thing to have. Because what you are purchasing, Williamson is fundamentally saying, what you're purchasing is not a nice bottle of scent. What you're purchasing is meaning. The meaning it gives to your life. That you are as glamorous as that lady in the photograph there. In reality, you could be the size of a house with a face like the back end of a bus. But what you're purchasing is the sense of glamour. Oh, look, I've got this bottle, therefore I am somehow part of her story, part of 
this you know, on the beach in the bikini it's well, presumably summer certainly she's looking very golden and tanned so it has all these connotations of um, yeah, free and easy life on the beach being relaxed being on holiday putting your feet up uh, maybe at I suppose she could be on the beach at Clacton who knows but presumably the implication is that she is on the beach at Tahiti or somewhere terribly exotic and exciting rather than somewhere boring and prosaic and therefore you are somehow part and parcel of that lifestyle you're part of that glamour set because you have the the bottle of scent that goes with it you're part of that you're buying into it you are core as in the name of the, the scent because you have you've become part of the core set so is she right williamson how many people now find the meaning of their life through the stuff they buy not the innate function of the item but the advertising campaign attached to the item how many people find the meaning of their life through the the method the means of advertising through the stories the mythos the imagery spun by advertising campaigns and it's one thing to sit there and think other people then not those people next door they might do this but to what extent does each one of us get suckered in by advertising campaigns so this might be a nice junction to pause the video make yourself a coffee and sit back think to what extent is your own life shaped influenced formed by advertising campaigns because a key issue to bear in mind here is that this isn't just slightly gullible dozy people who are not terribly well educated who get suckered in by this, these things ralph lauren is not marketed to people who are uneducated with low incomes it's marketed to people who have high incomes and are usually therefore quite well educated in order to attain those high incomes in other words everyone whether you're educated or uneducated upper middle or, or working class whatever you are wherever you are in the system no matter your race your religion your your gender your sexuality any of those things regardless advertising targets you because advertising works across the board across every known demographic and therefore every single one of us will to some extent or another be influenced by advertising campaigns whether it's a small extent or hefty extent at some level we are each of us buying our identity buying our myths buying our narratives our, our sense of meaning because we have been influenced by an advertising campaign to purchase some product or another if not indeed an entire house worths of product so have a think about that how it impacts you how it impacts the people you've interviewed if you're in a group that's doing those interviews and then after you've had a nice coffee you can click play again now this brings us to the cart and horse arguments between people like uh, Laswell, Shaw and Clapper um, these are all earlier arguments but they've all been updated by more recent thinkers and adapted to things like the internet and, and technological phenomena that simply didn't exist when these arguments were initially being forwarded so last while going all the way back to the 20s proposed the hypodermic needle model of media this is the idea that the media injects ideas into people's heads gets you to think about stuff tells you what to think tells you how to vote how to believe how to view the world how to understand the world so in other words the media is the horse and the public of the cart we are being led by the media they tell us what we ought to think what we ought to understand what we ought to know about and that as an argument um, persisted for quite a long time quite a few decades uh, but gradually began to be critiqued and these days is not i won't say it's unpopular as a, an argument there are still many people who feel the media has far too much clout and power to lead us to think in certain directions but it has been more nuanced than when laswell first put that idea forward in 27. Um, 
But do you feel that you are led or that your friends, your people, your family are led by media campaigns, getting us to think in a certain way, inciting us to view, let's say, political leaders or um, films or books, or if if you're reading a, a review of a film in a newspaper, or a review of a book or or of a a product, is the the media getting you to think in a certain way, trying to lead you by the nose? McCombs and Shaw, they shifted the argument somewhat and and proposed the agenda setting theory. So this is a sort of a partway argument. It's not saying that the public entirely lead the, um, the media, which is more Clapper's argument that we decide what we like and the media are chasing us. So that's the kind of the, the opposite end of Laswell's argument in a sense. So, for example, let's say um, a particular newspaper, the Daily Star, for argument's sake, puts out a bunch of stories, and the people who normally buy the Daily Star don't like the stories they're reading. They think, oh, what load of rubbish, I don't agree with this anymore. And so they stop buying it. If they stop buying it in significantly large enough numbers, then the editor of the Daily Star is going to be thinking, oh, we're losing readers. Why are we losing readers? What can we do to win readers back? So they might do a little bit of research and they might work out that they need to stop putting out so-and-so type of stories because that's putting their readers off. And they need to put out a different type of story instead to lure those readers back in. So Clapper's argument, in other words, is that we are the ones buying newspapers deciding which TV channel to tune into and all of that. And therefore, if we don't like something, we'll not buy it or we'll turn it off. And the people producing media will rapidly realise they're losing audience, and so they will chase the audiences. They will put on things to lure us back, to give us what we want to hear. So if lots of people want to read right-wing points of view, a newspaper will start publishing right-wing points of view. But then if the audience shifts and decides they'd all much sooner read left-wing points of view, they'll stop buying the right-wing papers and and those papers who put left-wing points of view will increase their sales. And so you get these fluctuations in the market. The middle argument from McCombs and Shaw is the agenda-setting one, which says that newspapers and media in general per se don't lead what they do is set the agenda. They tell you what the options are. They can't force you to choose one option over another, but they can tell you what the options are to start with. So you can't have a view on a royal scandal if nobody has ever told you about that royal scandal taking place. So whether you're very anti the royal family or, or, or let's say I know, some obscure prince gets caught doing something dodgy, There will be some newspapers are all for the obscure prints and some newspapers are dead against the royal prints. And you yourself will not be able to express a view one way or the other until you are told what the prince has got up to. So if none of the newspapers tell you it's not on the agenda in the first place, you can't have a point of view about it. How do you find out about it? Now obviously that's 68 with McCombs and Shaw, and these days we've got social media where you can find out things before they've even happened, let alone having to wait for the next day's newspaper headlines to be published. So the dissemination of information is very different now than it was in the 60s. But uh, nonetheless, you still can't have a view until that view is put into the media. So the media has got to decide what's worth reporting in the first place. So they report these 10 stories, and then some of the 10 stories they'll have a pro view on, and some will have an anti view on, and different views in different papers. And that clapper point of view, that you'll go and choose whichever paper seems most in keeping with what your political inclinations are to start with, is a fair one. But you can't make that choice until you see what the headlines are to start with. The same you could say for advertising, so not just stories about the royal family or politicians or celebrities or what have you, but you can't like or dislike a chocolate bar if you don't even know that chocolate bar exists in the first place. So until you see the advert for it or you see the actual product on the shelf in the shop, you can't have a view this way, that way or anyway. So what the advertisers do is set the agenda by telling you 
what the products on offer are and then you decide if you like them or not. So in other words, does the advert make you buy the product? You can't put a gun to your head and make you buy the product. But what it can do is to tell you what the known range of products are. So if you never see a particular advert for a particular type of car, you wouldn't know that type of car exists in the first place. So you'd have no kind of preferences for it or against it because you didn't you didn't even know it's there. The advertisers put the agenda of what you could buy to start with. So they create the set of myths before you and then you choose from there. It does raise the question whether advertising is in quite the same category as newspapers. The newspaper is on the shelf, you buy it, you don't buy it. End of. But advertising, every time you turn on, well, not the BBC, but every time you turn on commercial television, you'll get adverts. Every time you walk down the street, there's a fair chance you'll pass a billboard. Uh, you turn on the radio, there's adverts. You go onto the internet to look at uh, knitting patterns or cake recipes or something, you'll be bombarded with adverts. Adverts are so immersive, it's, they're difficult to get away from newspapers. You can get away from, you can just not buy one. But adverts are quite difficult to get away with, away from rather. So that does beg the question of, as, are we so drowned in advertising that we can't quite turn off from it the way we could turn off from a newspaper or the way we could just not watch a particular TV channel? I don't know. Um, to get momentarily philosophical, I won't drown you in philosophy because this is my hobby horse, not yours. But just to flag this up as an issue, you might want to think about more in terms of dissertation than anything else. But you could start applying this to your interviews. Um, going back to the 17th century, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant said, we need to respect people as ends in themselves, respect people for who they are. That's the fundamental bedrock of all human decency, is to respect other people for who they are and to require other people to respect you for who you are. Where human decency goes on a slippery slope down the pan is when we start to treat other people as means to an end. That we don't really care about them in and of themselves, we just want to use them in some way, to exploit them. Um, or we allow other people to exploit us. Then that, then that goes down the pan quite quickly. So let's say um, you have an employer for argument's sake. Is your employer interested in you as a person? Do they want the best for you as a person? Or do they just want the job done? So you turn up and do it, and as long as you do it well, they couldn't care less whether you're happy, sad, well, unwell, or anything about you. Maybe they, they know nothing about you whatsoever. They could care even less about you. So all you are there for is to perform the function. And once you've done it, they stop thinking about you. If, if you are nothing but a function, a thing carrying out a function, then you are being devalued. You are being treated as a means to an end. Whereas if the employer likes you, maybe you work for a very small firm, for example, and everyone knows each other very well, they like you as a person. Obviously they still need the job done at the end of the day, but they like you as a person. They know your name. They know whether you're married or unmarried, if you've got kids or no kids. They know they're, they're friendly with you. They know about you and they care about you. And so they try to accommodate you as much as is humanly possible. That's the difference between being a means to an end and being an end in yourself. So we can understand advertising in two contexts here. We could say an advert is simply informing the buying public about the range of um, goods or services available to meet their needs. So you've got a, a leaky pipe in your house, you need a plumber. How are you going to find a plumber if no plumbers advertise themselves? You open the yellow pages or go online or whatever you're going to do and you look at an advert for a plumber and you go, oh, I'll, I'll hire that one. So if the plumbers weren't advertising, then you would not be able to get a very useful service. That's at one level. That would be an ethical level. So the um, the plumber putting in the advert 
He is not trying to exploit you or take advantage of you. They're just saying, if you ever need my services, this is how to get hold of me. Full stop. That's not exploitation. But what if, and this is where we're getting into some of the arguments from people like Baths and Dorno and so on, what if the advert convinces you that you must have something which five minutes earlier you'd never even heard of, let alone wanted? And now all of a sudden you feel inadequate because you don't have the goods that are being advertised. So you know, I feel terrible and awful because I don't own the latest designer shirt, which I've now seen in some advert telling me I absolutely must have, otherwise I'll be a bit of an oik if I don't have it. And so here I am sitting, sitting here feeling all oiky because I don't have that designer shirt, which 10 minutes earlier I didn't even know existed. Is that advert providing me with a useful service to overcome my oikiness, or is it manipulating me into buying something I didn't actually need for financial gain? Well, I need shirts. You know, got to wear something when I leave the house, otherwise it will frighten the horses. Um, but there's a difference between saying, if you need a shirt, we sell shirts, come here, and saying, if you don't have our shirt, you're clearly a peasant. You're clearly in the wrong set. You're not in the in crowd. And therefore, what's being sold to me isn't just a shirt. It's a sense of identity, a sense of belonging, a sense of being an esteemed person. It's selling me things which a shirt in and of itself will not give me. So if the plumber is saying, I'll come around and fix your pipes, you won't have a leaky pipe anymore. They're not offering me anything more than an end to my leaky pipe problem. If the plumber says, oh, I'll come around, fix your pipes, and your life will be fantastic and wonderful and smashing and glorious, then they're selling me a, a pup. They're selling me something that I will not get by hiring their service. How many adverts these days for consumer goods are straight down the line? Buy our bread. It's quite nice if you need a loaf of bread. Or how many are selling false goods? They're selling notions, concepts, mythos, and ideas which you will simply not acquire by buying that loaf of bread or that car or that shirt or chocolate bar or whatever the thing is. Um, Kant would say it's unethical for an advert to, to effectively lie to a person to convince them that they're going to acquire something, the, the domestic bliss by buying the OXO cube or whatever it happens to be um, when they won't get it. You should just say, buy this OXO cube, the gravy tastes nice. If you want gravy, here you go. These OXO cubes will give you gravy. Would we rush out and buy them in such vast numbers if that's all they said? Therein is a debate and certainly advertisers would probably say that um, the consumer has to take responsibility here. If we didn't keep rushing out to buy stuff, they wouldn't keep using these slightly unethical sales techniques to sell us stuff. Let the buyer beware. So if you want to apply this to your interviews, or possibly as ideas to, to bounce around for dissertation, you could start thinking about, well, why did this person buy the goods that they bought? Why were they disappointed with them afterwards? Is it because the goods were misrepresented? They thought they were buying into something, and when they got the reality of it, it wasn't what they imagined. Was it not what they imagined because the, the advert was so hyperbolic, so over the top, that um, they were buying into the mythos, and the mythos is simply not what is provided for you in the product. It's, it just isn't. So what was it about this purchasing experience that disappointed them? So you could start thinking about these contexts and start applying them to the analysis of the interview, or set of interviews rather. Marshall McLuhan, also back to the 16th American um, philosopher, very interesting man with lots of podcasts and things. Um, like I said, not podcasts, TV shows that are now uploaded to um, YouTube and similar sources, so you can listen to him um, and his ideas. One of his um, most popular phrases was, the medium is the message. 
So the medium would be, for example, a newspaper or a TV show or a radio show all these days, um, the internet, podcasts, things like that, blogs, things like that. So, so you look at the nature of the medium and the nature of the medium will change the way in which a message is conveyed and change the very nature of the message and perhaps is integral to the nature of the message. So let's give you an example. Um, if you get your news from a newspaper, what you're seeing is static. In the, what it says on the page now is exactly what it's going to say on the page in an hour's time. It's not going to suddenly update and tell me something new. So I'm gaining a message which is a snapshot of a moment in time, an unchanging snapshot of a moment in time. And it's written in such a way that I can't ask questions of it. I can't um, interrogate it. It's just, it's, it's there. Compare that to TV news, which is constantly updating, especially in this era that we have 24 hour a day news programs, unlike Marshall McLuhan's lifetime when TV actually shut down in the evening. So a news program I look at now in an hour's time or two hours time will probably be updated. There'll be something new on it. It will tell me a bit extra about the story it wasn't telling me before. So the very nature of TV news is that it is constantly changing and updating, unlike newspaper news, which is static and fixed and fluid. But still, I can't ask questions of a TV set. Well, I could, but the TV set's not the right answer. Um, however, if I go online, there will be type forms of websites which are interactive, not all are clearly, but some are. And so there will be places where I can go and I could, let's say, Facebook. And I can get regularly updated information on Facebook and I could be asking questions. Oh, what, what's this thing about in this news information? I, where did they get this news from? And someone will answer me. Now, I can't guarantee that the person answering my messages is in any way, shape, form, sane, stable or well-informed. They could be just making stuff up as they go along. Um, but I, I can engage with, I can interact with that style of um, news, that style of dissemination of information. It's a two-way street rather than a one-way street. It changes regularly. But I, I, what I don't get is quality control. So I've, I've got no sense that the person answering my questions knows what they're talking about. I just have to hope that they do. So there's all sorts of different ways of shaping and disseminating ideas. Something like a billboard that you've got in the photograph there. Billboards, generally speaking, are something you whiz by in a car. So what they say has to be the kind of information that you could get in a couple of seconds. A newspaper article, let's say, uh, oh, if you're reading the, the Times, for argument's sake, you could get a long, long article that takes you... I have 10 minutes to read through. You're not going to have 10 minutes to read a billboard because most people are driving past them. So the information needs to be snapshot quick and it needs to be strongly visual because you need to get the idea of what the advert is about very, very quickly. That's the nature of that advertising. It's very, very quick. Whereas a newspaper advert, you could mull over at your own leisure. So there's different ways of conveying information. Different, um, different styles, different mediums will deal with information in a very different way. So you might, for example, in your interviews, want to think about the, the people who were persuaded to buy something. Was it a TV advert, a newspaper advert? Did someone shove a flyer through their door? Did they see something online and buy it from there? Um, was it the shopping channel? Uh, what method was it that led them into making this a regrettable purchase and is there some element of sociological theory that you could then start applying to that style of media to explain why it was effective in getting someone to buy something they later regretted oh ah, so moving on talkie talkie talk. Um, how do adverts work? So McLuhan's um, argument here from 64, ads seem to work on the very advanced principle that a small pellet or pattern in a noisy, redundant barrage of repetition will gradually assert itself. 
Ads push the principle of noise all the way to the plateau of persuasion. They are quite in accord with the procedures of brainwashing. So these days we might, rather than saying small pellet or pattern, we might use a phrase like meme. Um, they're, they're, in other words, there's a lot of ca chaos and cacophony, but there is a central message that gets pushed, a very brief, short message that gets pushed and pushed and pushed. And if you see the advert several times over, or a succession of ongoing adverts related to the same product, um, even though there's a lot of noise and movement and sound and colour and what's it, especially TV adverts, the core message is the same. And it's the core message that sinks in the repetition. Um, on American TV, things like the History Channel, most of which is produced in America, there is a guideline that the presenters of uh, factual programs should repeat their facts three times, beginning, middle and end of the show, in order for the audience to absorb and take the information in. Because if it's less than three times, it won't sink in. If it's more than three times, people get bored hearing it. I don't know if the same rule applies in other countries with other TV shows, but that's an American TV rule. And it's also used in teaching, that you have to say the same thing three times for it to sink in. Fair point, is that true? In order to get the information across, it's got to be in there. The bit about brainwashing is interesting in that um, brainwashing isn't just saying one thing again and again and again. It's the overwhelming of someone with sensory information, it's sensory overload. Redundant barrage of repetition notion, and in amongst all the gabble, you put in the information you want that person to think. That's where the brainwashing comes in. It is through repetition, but repetition covered up in noise and, and chaos. That's what makes it so effective. At 64, is that still true now? Smart in 2010, much more recent, obviously. Um, highlights this idea that mo adverts, particularly TV adverts and internet adverts, work most effectively where they pull on emotions. Love, hate, fear, hope, disgust. Strong emotions. If they engage your emotions, you will remember them. Even if you can't always remember the product. And that's an interesting argument in itself. Is that, is that an effective advert? So if you can remember the advert because it was very visual or evocative or emotional or what happened, but you, you're, you can't actually remember what the hell the product was, has that advert worked? It might have worked as a piece of cinema, but has it actually worked in terms of selling you the product? Because if you can't remember what it was advertising, it's going to have gone in one way and out the other. Has it really worked? Um, I can remember various Guinness adverts where they, they had... Um, CGI of, of crashing waves on a beach with horses worked into as a, a, a sort of computer generated horses worked into the waves and it was very beautiful very evocative very well done I don't drink any more Guinness now than I did before I'm about one can a year if even that sometimes so it's not sold me Guinness I've not gone out and bought more Guinness but I do remember the adverts I remember the visual imagery and, and that's perhaps a, an area where maybe the company hiring the advertising agency and the agency themselves start to part company with quite what the purpose of the advert is. Douglas and Isherwood, a few years earlier, um, argue that a key function within advertising, as well as selling you the, the mythos and the story and everything else, that mythos is there to link you to other people. That's what it does. That's, that's a key feature of an effective mythos rather than an ineffective mythos. Does this bond you to other people to want to be part of a community, to want to be part of an ongoing body of people? So the community could be, as per the, I keep going on about Oxo um, you know, the, the happy family around the table eating a roast dinner. That's a community, the happy family community. Um, a very small scale community. But it could also be saying that as with the um, the advert for the, the perfume with the lady on the beach. If you buy this perfume, 
you will be like all of the other glamorous people who are very thin and tanned and, and pretty and have exotic holidays because they're very rich. You'll be part of that elite set and it will bond you with that set of people. And what we want, I suppose, is what Douglas and Isherwood are boiling down to. What we generally want is to feel a sense of belonging. Who we want to belong to, that's another question again, but we want a sense of belonging. And is this what advertising is fundamentally selling us when all is said and done? Strip it away, boil it down to its bare bones. Is it selling us a sense of belonging? Whether belonging to our family, belonging to the super cool rich set, belonging to the neighbourhood community or whoever the hell it is that we want to belong to, is that what it's flogging us? There's a question. Okay, moving on to discourse analysis. Leaving the realm of advertising mostly behind. One's a bit of it at the end of the lecture, but mostly leaving it behind. Um, what is discourse analysis? Well, it's a way of examining, ex analysing, explaining the functions of language. Um, it's used quite heavily in interactive language. That is to say, people, well, all language is someone talking to someone, but where there is a, a conversation particularly is where discourse analysis comes into its own. You can use it in other ways for one directional expression of language. I, person A talks to person B, but person B just doesn't say anything back. You can use it for that, but it, it works very well, particularly well for anything where you're analyzing interactions and ongoing conversation between two or more people. So you've got lists there of various forms of things that you could analyze with discourse analysis, marketing materials, newspapers, and so forth. Um, so in terms of what it focuses on, different purposes and types of language. So when it says types of language, that doesn't mean French, Spanish, Italian. Um, types of language here mean um, ways in which language is used. So for example, you could use language to discuss something very um, complex and technical to computer geeks talking to each other about computers using jargon terms would be an example of a type of language. Um, two devout um, Muslims talking to each other about um, things connected to their religion and using words, phrases, concepts that anyone outside their religion quite possibly would not understand. That's a type of language. Um, two Star Wars fans discussing Star Wars, referring to characters and planets and alien species and whatnot, all of which are, might be terms and things that would go completely over the head of someone who's got zero interest in Star Wars. So types of language. Also things like the way you talk to a four-year-old is one type of language. The way you talk to a 40-year-old um, with a PhD would be a different type of language different level of language, different sophistication of language. Purposes of language include things like giving commands and directions, asking questions and inquiries, explaining something. Um, the, the function of the language you're engaged with, what, what are you trying to achieve with the style of language you're using? Cultural rules and conventions, well that could be a notion of who talk, talks first and who talks second. So in some cultures, it might be the eldest person in the room is always deferred to as, as starting the conversation or having the most authoritative say. In some cultures, it might, if you've got a, say, a mixed group of men and women, some cultures, it might be the man who speaks first and the woman who responds or vice versa. Uh, it could be down to a professional issue. You go to consult your doctor who, who says what, who talks about what, well, the, the, the doctor role and the patient role help shape and define the conventions of communication in that sort of a situation. So that there's different sorts of styles and ways of communicating, depending on where you are, the culture you're in, and so forth. Um, values, beliefs, and assumptions. Um, the, the language we use. Um, do you say um, dustman? Or do you say rubbish disposal operative? Each has its own set of values and beliefs and assumptions behind it. 
Um, do you walk into a, a room and say, um, can all the... Well, actually, no, forget that one. I'll give you a different example. I, I went to a talk um, earlier this year. Well, it's a series of talks by different people. And most people just stood up and, and said, well, my name is so-and-so, and, -so, and they, they delivered their talk. One particular person stood up and, and said, my name is so-and-so, and my preferred pronouns are she, her. No one else said that. The fact that she wanted to flag up her pronouns says a lot about her values, her beliefs, and what she felt was important to communicate, and equally, what the other people did not think was worth communicating, and what they assumed the audience would know, or assumed the audience would care about, and what she, the woman who did say that, what she assumed the audience would or would not know and care about. So it's that what you say reflects what you think your audience already knows or what you think they don't know. Um, what do you think is important for them to be told about? Uh, all sorts of values, ideas, beliefs, assumptions are conveyed in language, not just gender, it's everything. A whole raft of issues are conveyed in the styles of language we use with each other. And this is why it's particularly interesting when it's applied to a conversation rather than a one-way form of communication because then you get the interaction between two or three or four people each with their own values and beliefs and assumptions and how those different forms of values and beliefs interact with one another in the course of a conversation that's where discourse analysis really comes into its own and you can look at social political historical context so if you were looking at a letter or a book or something written in 1812 and comparing it to something written in 2011 then clearly you've got very different historical contexts, very different social assumptions and strata and, and all sorts of um, political backdrops, both political in the usual sense of issues of government, but also in the small sense of um, social politics and dynamics between individuals. So it's a way of picking apart, discourse nice is a way of picking apart all of these different things and explaining them. Um, which could be, uh, for example, interviews you've conducted and then you're applying discourse analysis to those interviews or to a focus group that you've studied. Or it could be some pre-published text that you're looking at, like a newspaper or a book or what have you, that you're then analysing. So there are four steps in discourse analysis, three on this screen, one on the next. Um, start, define the research question and select content analysis. Well, defining the research question is a key issue for everything, not just discourse analysis. If you don't know what you're looking for in the first place, then you're not going to find it. So having a question in your mind, what is it I want to know about? Why, what claims or printed or spoken materials do I want to look at? What subject matters? What contexts? Um, what is it I'm trying to explore? Those are all the sorts of questions you'd ask for yourself. And then having decided your research question, that would determine the sort of content that's worth your looking at. So if you want to understand the dynamics in the present government's handling of the corona crisis by looking at speeches and printed advice given out, then the content well, clearly needs to be all about that. There's no good analysing Jane Eyre if what you want to know about is the current government's analysing of um, the coronavirus. So, very silly example there, but something that would direct what the content of your analysis should be once you've decided what the research question is. There you move on to gathering the information and uh, reading around theory, developing theory. So go out, find um, those newspapers or record those conversations or have those interviews find those books, those look at those websites, whatever it is that's relevant, dig it all up, put it in one place where you can start ploughing through it and then start thinking uh, about how you can apply theory to um, such key issues. And this, in, for example, in religious studies, is referred to as hermeneutics, where you start to look at these issues of um, who wrote it, who published it, why did they publish it and why did they write it? Who was it intended to be read by? 
or heard by if it's spoken content, who is it aimed at? So knowing who the assumed audience is, is as important as knowing about the person writing it or speaking it in the first place. So who do they think is, is listening to them or reading them or what have you? Um, clearly, whoever they thought was listening to them probably isn't a sociology student. They probably thought they were talking to somebody else entirely. Um, and knowing how it was received by the intended audience of the day is also quite useful in and of itself. Start to look for contents, step three, for patterns, for themes, for repeated issues. If you're looking at several conversations or several forms of printed material, what patterns start to crop up between them? Are there key phrases, words, terms that get used? Are they structured in a certain way? And that structure could be both for the printed word and for the spoken word in terms of how people engage turn-taking, who says what to who and where and when and how, and that sort of thing. What keeps cropping up? Because it's the patterns you're looking for. Step four, that's where you put it all together and you start reflecting back. So you're engaging in coding as you're highlighting these patterns and themes. Well, this was spoken about a lot, or this person always seems to talk first and that person always seems to talk second. Um, this person always seems to be very forceful and that person always seems to be very mild. Uh, so you, you're, you're not only looking at what is said, but how it is said, who says what to who, all of these sorts of issues that go beyond stand, the standard forms of coding that we've looked at so far. So it's looking at all these background, um, more subtle, more nuanced issue, issues, and then trying to work your theories into that to explain and, and justify, really, the conclusions that you're coming towards. Part of this is frame analysis, which is a technique that goes back to Goffman and builds on ideas from Wittgenstein of game analysis. Um, sorry, language, not game analysis, language games. Um, uh, so frames and games, both these, these two ideas from Wittgenstein and Goffman working to each other. Um, frame analysis is understanding the context in which something is said will heavily shape the nature of what is said or what is written. Will change how it is received by the audience, um, change all sorts of ways. So, it's a few um, light examples you've got there. Imagine you were reading about a murder or hearing about a murder. Um, if you were reading the Sun newspaper and details of a murder there, would you as a, a reader understand that differently from if you were reading or listening to a pathologist's lab report about a murder. Clearly that they're both about murders, possibly even both about exactly the same murder. But they are written in very different ways, they are aimed at very different audiences, who's likely to read the pathologist's lab report versus who's likely to read the Sun newspaper. Um, they're going to be using different language, different terminology, uh, even things like length of sentence is likely to be quite different from one written format to the other written format. Uh, how are they understood? So if you know that the thing you are reading is from the Sun newspaper, would that change your frame of reference, your frame of analysis and understanding from if than if you believed it was from a pathologist's report, or if you believed it was written in the Daily Mail, for argument's sake, or in the, um, the Daily Worker? So even within the realm of newspapers, does the context change, the frame change from one newspaper to the next to the next? So that frame could be um, how trustworthy you find the report, how um, reliable you think the report is, what you think the purpose of the report is for. Is it to shock you? Is it to inform you? Is it to titillate you? you with scandalous details. What is the purpose of this writing? What is it aimed at achieving? If it's a work of fiction, again, it's like a, a radio play, like a Christie play, when they're talking about a murder, um, the context changes entirely from something that is theoretically true. Well, you certainly hope the pathologist lab report is true. Maybe the journalist tabloid newspaper report is a bit open to debate, but at least in theory, it's true, whereas the radio play, you know, up front, is not true. 
Um, but what about, for example, in America when Orson Welles made his very famous radio broadcast of the War of the Worlds, the H.D. Worlds novel about the Martians invading Earth? A lot of people missed the first few minutes of the radio broadcast where it said, this is a radio play by Orson Welles. They, they missed that. They tuned in late. And what they thought they were hearing was a news report of an actual Martian invasion of America. And so there was a lot of panic in America because people were scared to death. They misunderstood a radio play as a news broadcast because of the way the play was done. It sounded like the whole thing was done as a series of broadcasts and interviews with professors and generals and, and politicians and whatnot. So if you missed the start of it, as a lot of people did apparently, then it would cha totally change the context, the frame of what was being presented and therefore what was being understood. So this is about understanding the, the frame in which something is presented is both the intention of the author, publisher, but also the understanding of the consumer of the material, and not just written material, but spoken material. So the, the context in which you might hear a vicar's sermon in a church could be very different from the context, the frame in which you hear uh, the prime minister talking about political issues, or an actor talking about the charity work that they get up to, that sort of thing. It totally changes your understanding of what's being presented to you. Um, we'll just very, very briefly flash over critical discourse analysis, fair cut side, because uh, this is a topic which we'll come on to in the third year. And if, you, if you're particularly interested, you can do some background reading on this. Critical discourse is Marxist. Again, the idea of going back to Marxist argument of society understood through the lens of conflict and um, power struggles. So it picks up on Marxist ideas, it also picks up on ideas from Foucault of seeing the world as power struggles between rival groups and therefore understanding any kind of written or spoken discourse as expressive of power struggles. Who, it, Which group does the speaker belong to or the writer belong to? What agendas are they advancing? What power structures are they proposing and enforcing? And if it's a two, three way conversation with other people bouncing forth ideas with each other, um, are they all from the same group? Are they from different groups? So are there interactions and power struggles between different groups? It's a bit reductionist in all honesty. It's this rather tired old Foucault argument of, see, of not seeing the quality of anything except to see it as merely a power game, a fight, a spat between different groups trying to establish their regimes of truth, which I find increasingly reductionist and misses the, the beauty of language, but then you could say that's a very class-based thing anyway, to see language as a, a medium of beauty rather than a medium of truth or a medium of power, which is both Foucault and Marx's view that it's all about the power and the struggles between rival groups. Uh, but there are clearly some forms of um, discourse which are very overtly about one group throwing its weight around over another group. Although um, Fairclough's argument is this isn't just a, a theory to be applied to very overt examples. It's a theory that could be applied to any example because his arg Fairclough's argument is that all language is power and power games. So, what kinds of things might you analyse? We won't go over all of this because it'll get a bit dull. And you can pause the video and, and read through it and, and reflect on these yourselves. But let's say it's it's either a spoken conversation or a written one. And you look at the range of vocabulary it's used, what this tells you about things like the educational background, the hobbies and interests and, and kind of specialist jargon and, and so on used as vocabulary. The grammar structures, is there somebody speaking terribly, terribly Queen's English? Or is it a bit like that and in it and that I mean and being very kind of down market styles of grammar or somewhere in the middle? Is the person using active grammar or passive grammar? So who's that which is power struggle type stuff again? Um, and suggestive of what they're saying and how they're saying it. Um, how is structure used? How are arguments built up or evidenced or not evidenced, failed to be evidenced at all? The genre issues. Uh, are you looking at a, 
tabloid newspaper or a broadsheet? Are you looking at someone's private journal, their private diary? Or are you looking at a lab report that's different styles of writing aimed at different audiences? Um, this, the non-verbal one obviously only applies to actual spoken conversations um, rather than written documents. Spoken conversations could be a conversation you as an interviewer started off or you could be looking at a I know, question time on the TV and how all of the panellists interact with each other or you could be looking at a, a film or a, or a stage play, something in that line. So it's the silences, the, the umming and the ahhing, the facial expressions, the body language, tone of voice, who's excitable, who's calm, that sort of thing. And conversational coding, do people very politely talk one after the other, listen, take their turns, or are they butting into one another, shouting each other down, ignoring what somebody just said and, and you know, saying something at total cross purposes? Or a situation you might have been in where you just tell somebody something and then they ask you a question about exactly what you've just told them and you think, I just said that to you, did you not understand it? And then you have to explain it in a different context. Uh, all those sorts of things that come as conversational codes. But you can think about all of the examples there. Uh, pause the video, I'm going to have a think. If this is something you want to do, uh, perhaps for a dissertation. Or it might be useful for a different module, perhaps. Nearly at the end. And then I'm going to have a very large cup of tea. Emic and etic approaches. There's a lot more to this than just this little bit I put up here. But this is just to flag these notions up because this is more something you can start to think about for your dissertation. Although you can certainly bring this into your interviews for the second assignment. It could be made relevant to that. So emic approaches, and these are terms developed mainly by Pike back in the 50s. But emic approaches are studying um, from an internal perspective. So it could be studying people who are very similar to yourselves or more, when I say similar, um, that could be as in a man talking to other men or a white person talking to other white people, a middle class person talking to other middle class people. But it's more in the sense of not so much the demographic, quite as much as shared experience. So the example you've got there, you've gone along to, to interview people from a Weight Watchers club about their dieting experiences. And you yourself as a researcher have been on lots of diets. So you might not be a member of that particular Weight Watchers club. And that club could have people who are black and white and male and female and rich and poor. So their demographics might not match your demographic. But what you have in common is the experience of dieting. So when you're writing up the report, you are writing it up and analysing their conversations and their interviews and all the rest of it from an inside perspective. And this is the key issue. You're an insider. You yourself know what it is to be on a diet. So when these people are talking about diets, you understand what they're talking about because you've done it too. And I should say the, the others you've got there, Kotak and Egan and so they've written about both emic and etic. So although that bit only appears in the left-hand column on the screen, it applies across the board if you want to read around any of those people. And there are others out there who've also looked at these issues. So the etic perspective is the um, outsider's point of view, essentially. So you could be writing about a group of, group of people who are demographically very, very different from yourself, or more critically, whose experiences you simply don't share. So the example there, so you've got a white European, we probably should have, let's say, had atheist or Christian or whatever, the, studying a Hindu community. Um, Varanasi is a city in India. Um, so this is somebody who is not part of the ethnic group, but more critically, they're not part of the religious group. So someone who is not a Hindu studying Hindus, talking about their religious beliefs and so on, and their practices and their rituals and their ceremonies and this and that and the other. Um, so they're coming at it as an outsider. So when they're analysing what's being said, they analyse it from an outside perspective. Um, it goes deeper than this in the sense of some of the issues we touched on in previous weeks as well relates to that. But it's not just have you had the experience, have you not had the experience, but it's also are you trying to explain the phenomena in a way that the people experiencing it would be sympathetic to they would share that that theoretical philosophical stance 
or are you trying to explain it in a way that they would not agree with and share, but in a way that nonetheless makes sense to you as a researcher? So take, for example, um, an atheist interviews a group of um, churchgoers about their belief in God, and because they're an atheist researcher, they, they don't have the belief in God, they don't go to church, they don't share the experiences, etc. That's the outsider element, but also critically, when they come to do the report, they start talking about Freudian notions of father fixations and father images. And so while well, you know, when these people praying to God, it's really a father fixation, etc, etc. That's a theory that probably the people in the church would go, hang on a minute, I don't think that at all. I don't see my relationship to God in that way whatsoever. So the, the analytic theory being applied comes not from within the tradition and belief system and, and accepted ideas of the people being studied, but is applied from an outside perspective. This is the researcher saying, this is what I think is going on here, not necessarily what these people believe to be going on with themselves. Whereas a more emic approach would be to come up with a, a theory that not only do you as the researcher think is true, but which the people you're studying could go along with as well and would agree with and say, yeah, I think you're probably right. That's probably what's going on here. I agree with that. So the insider versus the outsider approach. So that might have an application to the interviews. Are you interviewing people about a topic to which you're inside or to which you're outside? But also when it comes to your dissertations, you might be thinking, am I coming at this, this issue, whatever issue is, as an insider or as an outsider? And how does that change an impact? And in the third year, we can get on more depth to discussing how this has an impact. So at this level, it's just flagging these terms up. Next year, we get on to the more um, detailed understanding of how it impacts research. Nearly there. So last little bit, um, going back to advertising and discourse and so on, and how we start to relate discourse to advertising. Um, I, I don't know if anyone's seen that advert. I've not, hadn't seen this particular image, but certainly I've seen the TV adverts. Um, so well, obviously I saw this image when I was nicking it off the internet and putting it into the PowerPoint. But up until then, I'd, I've seen the adverts for McCain's Oven Chips, where you've got mixed race families and families with disabled people in them and Muslim families and gay families and all sorts of things. Um, the, the advert here is with the two gay dads. Um, so Holton Cameron's argument is that advertising needs to be thought of as discourse, not as one-way street. In other words, it's not just an advertiser talking at a mute audience. The audience talks back, especially in this day and age of the internet, where there is dialogue and, and uh, it's an ongoing banter, but if, if that's the right time to use, ongoing discussion between the audiences who are being targeted and the advertisers doing the targeting, and the companies hiring the advertisers to sell their, their wares, obviously. <coughs> so a bit of a three-way conversation. Um, so what's being sold here? Well, look at the tagline, we are family. So you buy the chips and you will be a family. Obviously, this is the, the narrative of your family. You buy the chips, you won't be a family just because you bought a bag of flame oven chips. But this is the implication going on here. You're buying into the family narrative. But when it comes to the two gay dads, you're buying into a different family narrative than those 1950s adverts for Oxo Cubes, where it was mum and dad and the traditional heterosexual family with 2.4 kids. So is this challenging the narrative or reinforcing the narrative? So is this social engineering? Is this McCain hiring some company and that company has decided we need to challenge the narrative? So are they doing this because they want to expand their customer basis? So they're no longer only selling chips to straight couples, they're now selling chips to gay couples and selling chips to people who might not have seen um, people such as themselves in chip adverts previously. Is anyone ever persuaded to buy a bag of oven chips only because you see somebody who looks a bit like you in the advert? So if you're a black person and you've never seen a black person in a TV advert for chips, does that put you off wanting to buy chips? Or would you not give a, a toss about the 
impact the ethnicity of people and adverts when you're in the shops and you're looking in the freezer and there's a bag of chips in there. Personally, I suspect most people don't give a damn about things like this, but advertisers seem to think this is a key issue. Um, that if, if gay people are sitting at home going, oh, look, there's a gay couple in that chip advert, let's rush out and buy the King's Oven chips. Somewhat naive expectation there, I, I suspect, but that that's, appears to be the logic behind it. Is this a good thing? that advertisers are now increasingly getting involved not only in selling us products but in selling us political narratives that we should want to see um, more ethnic diversity or more sexual diversity or more this that the other type of diversity in adverts that we should want to see politicized messages in adverts or should people who sell chips focus on telling us that the chips taste nice and stop with the politics. What's your view on this? This would be a good area for discussion and maybe you can discuss this with each other through social media. Um, let me know your ideas in time. Uh, some of you, I dare say many of you, will have seen the Gillette adverts that were up last year um, selling razor blades saying, is this the best a man can be? And in we're talking about bullying and toxic masculinity and having a nag basically at men for not being um, well behaved enough and implying that they should be better. Uh, completely backfired on them, there were endless complaints, and in fact Gillette lost £8 billion pounds worth of revenue. The fact that they're still in existence tells you just how rich that company is in the first place. But that's one hell of a financial downturn, £8 billion quid, which was put primarily down to that advert campaign as annoying the hell out their customer basis who were cheesed off at being hectored and lectured at and told they were rubbish and not good enough and had to try harder and effectively said, well, shove your razor blade, we'll go and buy a different company's razor blade. <coughs> Excuse me. So an issue, again, may be more relevant to um, dissertation than to your current coursework, but what is the role of advertising when it comes to pushing social political messages should they do it should they not do it well they are doing it whether they should or should not how do they do it that's an issue you could look at in a dissertation um dialogue has always gone on to some extent that even back in the 50s pre-internet they would have test groups before releasing their adverts to the general public so they would get in groups of people who were prospective customers show them their adverts and say would you buy this product? And if everyone said no, then they would change their advertising. So even there, there was a kind of small scale testing of the waters before the adverts ever went public. But these days with the internet and a lot more engagement between consumer and company, are companies much, much more sensitive to how consumers are reacting to their advertising campaigns? And are they adapting and changing accordingly? So if, if people say, oh, well, that advert is terribly sexist or terribly racist or terribly this or terribly that, do advertisers respond? How many people have to say it for advertisers to care? So if, if one person thinks it's terribly sexist and nobody else does, does the advertiser just say, oh, you know, whatever, and brush it off? But if a hundred people, a thousand people, a million people, how many people does it take to raise an issue to say, this is wrong, what you're doing? for them to then change and that, that sort of two-way street going on there something to consider anyway now um it was scheduled back when life was normal that in the week after the easter holidays you would have um given a very short presentation on the um crime stats that you had found in your newspapers that's not viable, obviously, at the moment, because, well, I suppose it's possible they may find a miracle cure over Easter and we're all back in class. But even if they are, it's going to be too rushed a job to expect you to be able to do presentations. So we are probably, and I say probably, going to drop the presentations because we have to wait for confirmation from the external examiner before we can go ahead on this. Um, whether we do something else instead or just stick to the written report and leave it at that, depends on what the external examiner says. So I'll put an official statement up in the announcement section, Brightspace, 
as soon as I hear back from the external examiner. But at this stage, I suggest you don't panic and start trying to create a presentation because I, I don't see as that's going to be a feasible thing to happen. But what will happen instead depends on what the external examiner says. So I'm just waiting to hear from him. And then I will let you know. Um, but it won't affect your grade one way or the other, so don't, don't worry about that situation. So after the Easter break, um, it'd be lovely if we are back in class by then. And if we are, we'll get on to um, sociological theories around dieting and look a, a bit at narrative analysis and standpoint theory, which we've touched on in the last of standpoint theory. Um, if we're still all on lockdown, then obviously this will be another narrative, uh, sorry, narrated, another narrated PowerPoint uploaded for you. But at this stage in time, I, I don't know anymore what's going to happen when you do. Um, the three-week lockdown that Boris Johnson imposed will be ended by then, so who knows? Who knows? It might be extended, it might be ended, things might be changed. But hope you're all doing well, and again, if you want to bounce questions to me through email or social media or uploading to the YouTube channel uh, comments, um, please feel free to do so. In the meantime, take care, and hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye.